I don't disagree with you that you know winning the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival puts a target on your back. I think in Venice what you notice is people come into a movie with their arms open and they go, oh, what's this gonna be? And then by the time you get to Toronto, they come in like this with their arms folded and go, what is this? You know, it's a whole different thing. You can feel the energy and I get it, you know, it's like they're being told it's something special. A slapdash movie. Mm -hmm. This is a very carefully thought out movie and may I ask, given your New York roots, almost personal it feels. Yeah, I, w I would say, um, you know, Scott Silver and I, when we sat down to write it, um, we sat down to write a movie about empathy and the lack thereof in the world. Uh, we, we, we wanted to make a movie about the power of kindness and um, that's gen genuinely where it started from. Um, and the, 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 the care that we put into making it that you're talking about, you know, that goes through all the production heads and everybody I worked with. We really came to try and make something great, something really thought out and careful and um, deliberate. Um, yeah, so thank you for noticing. <laughs> So how hard was it to talk Warner Brothers into it? And do you think that Joker could be a movie on its own without DC? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, could the movie have been called Arthur and not included, you know, being wrapped in the Joker package? I mean, sure, we, we, we could have done that, but, but part of it for me was, um, kind of using the motor of the comic book films and um, doing something um, a little bit differently than the, the movies that have been made before in the comic book world. I thought it was kind of the fun part of making this film was using that space and doing a deep dive character study, which you don't see often in that space, um, um, on a villain. So uh, while yes, we could have written a movie called Arthur and got Joaquin Phoenix hopefully to do it, but I don't know that it would have resonated as, as much. I mean, I know it wouldn't have. And I think it's more important that these issues and themes that are brought up in the movie reach as wide an audience as possible. Um, yeah, the movie was a hard sell at Warner Brothers because quite frankly, it would have been easier if we called it Arthur. Um, and with a it, smaller budget. Yeah, with a smaller-ish budget, of course. Um, because we were taking, we were stepping into their IP land, which is a huge, huge resource for Warner Brothers, and kind of taking um, it and turning it on its head. They didn't, it didn't need to be fixed. It wasn't like um, what they were doing was broken. They've been having a lot of success, particularly recently. So, you know, and the other thing that happens at studios, and I've talked about this before, is, you know, the people that you pitch it to and sell it to often get you know, pushed out or resign or whatever, and then there's new people. So we pitched it to a different group of people, and then we went off and wrote it for a year and a half. And when we came back, everybody was different. So now you have to convince those people to, to why the movie's important and why it should get made. Luckily, we had Blair Rich, who'd been there through all the regimes, and has been there as long as I have. I mean, I've, I've been at that studio for 15 or 16 years now. Um, and so Blair was a great ally on the film and helped us kind of with those last hurdles. While she didn't think, or none of us thought it would be the financial success that it's turned into, she thought it was um, worth making and, and taking a shot with it. So tell me how you orchestrated the disciplined, precise look, aesthetic feel of the movie versus the chaos at its center represented by Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, that is just filmmaking to me. You know, l my biggest um, partner in making films for the past uh, forever has been Lawrence Scher, my cinematographer. And we talk a lot about the look of the movie and the tone of the movie and the pace of the movie um, and the precision of the movie. 
and we do that then with Mark Bridges, the, the costume designer, and Mark Friedberg, the production designer. I mean, we all went in to make something that felt really precise, um, and s slowly it gets less and less so as he kind of slowly ascends or descends, depend on how you look at it, into Joker. Um, the movie, somebody said to me, I think it was at Venice, they said the movie feels like it was directed by the Joker. And I really like that. And I know what they mean. Um, it felt like there was an agent of chaos behind the film, not just what the film was about. But you had to manage that. Sure. And, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, you have a, uh, let's say the, the, the famous scene where uh, he's looking in the mirror mm -hmm. uh, after he's killed for the first time and he's feeling good. Right. Right. So that's the... That was the sort of pivot moment for the movie, right? With Joaquin and you uh -huh. improvising, yeah. a scene, right? Well, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, I come from comedy, and we do that all the time. I mean, I always used to say on the on the on the comedies, um, you know, making films is is jazz. It's not math. I always said, and what we mean is like you have it's a living, breathing organism, a movie, and you have to be able to react and respond. And even though there's 300 people on the crew and there's 14 trucks parked over there, we have to be as nimble as you can be. And working with an actor like Joaquin, he needs that freedom, quote unquote, and that um, uh, space um, to, to do what he did. So I think we were, uh, on this movie, I, I don't know that Joaquin needs that on every movie. I can't speak to what he needs on what he does next or what he's done before. But on this movie, he needed to feel that freedom. and. I've been used to giving that freedom, I think, because of the comedies I've done. And, you know, you don't work with uh, Will Ferrell or Zach Galifianakis and say, sit here and say it just like this. Action. This is not how you do it in a, you know, it's, it's a much looser atmosphere. I was doing a movie with Robert Downey Jr. and Zach Dudate, and Robert came up to me one day and said, I feel like we're making a student film. And... I took that as a compliment. I knew what he meant. It just felt like the inmates were running the asylum. And I think that makes an actor feel really free to, to try things and free to fuck up, quite frankly, because it's just like, yeah, we're all just kind of doing this, you know? Now, you were working on a, on a really limited budget. So were you able to do lots and lots of takes? I mean, for a, a movie of this scale, this was a, yeah, a reasonable, I mean, the, what is it, 56 million? Yeah, the, the, it was around 60, quite honestly. But the, the budget um, for this movie, we had the, 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 the budget we needed. Um, you know, Warner's, while in the Warner Brothers realm or in the comic book world, it's an independent film, that budget. In movie making, that's as big as a budget as I've ever had, and as good as a budget as I've ever had. And if you really look at the scope of the movie, you know, it's, it's not gigantic. Um, it's, a, it's a character study. Um, we do some cool big things in it, but it, it didn't need more. Really, the one thing I was fighting for most was time, um, was days, because I really wanted, again, that um, Joaquin and I decided early on that we are going to take our time with it. And so we ended up literally to the minute with just the right amount of time. But Joaquin said to me early on, why do you keep fighting them for more days? Why is it more days? I go, he goes, I, I shoot movies in six weeks most of the time, you know, some of these smaller films he's done. And I said, we're going to need it, we're going to need it. And we needed like every last minute. It was great. But we, we, I mean, this was my 10th film. So I'm pretty experienced with budget and managing that time. I knew exactly what we needed early on and exactly the days we needed. And... That was a discussion with Warners, but we got there and it ended up being right. So talk about the influences behind the choice of period. And I grew up in New York. Mm -hmm. I recognize. Yeah. This is New York. Yeah. Is this New York or is it Gotham? Well, I mean, it's Gotham via New York, via the New York that you and I grew up in. Um, the New York, um, we wanted it to feel like a city on the brink, you know, a broken down city. Um, it was really um, influenced by Larry, who, who grew up in New Jersey, and my own memories of what New York was, and of course, the movies of that time. I mean, movies are always a great time capsule to go back and look at 
you know, <clears throat> network and of course Taxi Driver, uh, King of Comedy. I mean, there's a lot of, ton of references, you know. And you kind of can watch those movies, French Connection, and, and just look at the city, even if you ignore the film. And it's these beautiful time capsules, and we just wanted it to feel not heightened. Everything in the movie, the direction I gave to everybody, from Mark Bridges to Mark Friedberg to Larry to Emma, our producer, and, and even Hilder, the, the composers, you just want to run everything through as realistic a lens as possible and just make it feel grounded. So, of course, it feels like New York. We're calling it Gotham because it's Gotham, because it's a comic book film. But yeah, our references were all late 70s, early 80s New York City. You think this is funny? <laughs> is this a joke to you? <laughs> I certainly, I've seen the blowback. I've seen the blowback to the blowback and the blowback to the blowback to the blowback. It, it seems to keep going. They have conventional wisdom in their brain, more than you would think. Oh, no, no, I, what, I agree. What is, what is it supposed to be? That's right. And you're supposed to be this over here mm -hmm. and this over here. I and think that goes even... you broke the rules. Yes, we broke the rules. I think that even goes for me as a director. I think, you know, so many of the blowback that I noticed was, you know, the first paragraph or two of the review was about The Hangover. You know, like, and, and it, did, it wasn't treating this movie, it's like, how did this guy get to do this? Not, not pull it off, but how did he even get to do this? As if, as if movies get made by Warner Brothers coming and hiring you to do it. It's not the way I've ever made a movie. We write the movie and then we go and make the movie. Nobody asks, asked us to do the films, you know what I'm saying? But there's always like, why would they hire him to do, why would they hire the hangover guy to do this? It's like, this is not how it works. But um, yeah, it's been divisive uh, for a million reasons been an interesting thing to watch. Well, also the way the media has handled the movie. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a clickbait universe. Yeah. And quotes get taken out of stories and all, used. All the time. And you were a bit on the brunt of that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It was an interesting process for me. There's so many things that, that you know, you say. It's funny, like, even the thing I, I was quoted as saying about comedy, what I was saying was, I was talking specifically about um, 10 or 11 things in old school and in the Hangover and in the Hangover sequels that we couldn't do nowadays. And it wasn't saying nobody can be funny anymore. It was saying, oh, there are actually, I could point to a bunch of things that you just couldn't get away with nowadays. That's what we were, we were specifically talking about. I wasn't making a judgment call on all comedy, of course. And people that know me know that. And then you go, oh, well, you can correct it. And I'm like, I don't have a Twitter account. I wouldn't know how to correct it. Eh, who cares? There is something fun about, I grew up on professional wrestling. There's something fun about being the heel. <laughs> I can handle it. <laughs> and then your movie goes off and does a lot of business. Sure. Finally. Yeah. Which is, gives you the last laugh. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is what I meant when I said, you know, outrage is a commodity. I meant that it, it, it truly is people can find something to be outraged about turn it into a thing and it's what gets clicks and it what get you know and that that's it's been an interesting thing to watch would you make comedies now of course i would make comedies i was specifically speaking about certain literally jokes in old school and in and in the hangover that you wouldn't do now that even i wouldn't do now i was just saying how culture has changed you know there's a lot of pearl clutching that goes on in the world nowadays which is also what i meant when i said Oh, you know, well, forget it. Smile, to your fear and sorrow, smile. And maybe tomorrow, you'll find that life is still worthwhile. We both had a magical time making this film. We both had, I think, not to speak for him, but one of the most satisfying experiences of my career. So it has been interesting the last month and a half as people try to color it or change that thing. And Joaquin said to me early on when I said to him, God, you know, this movie might actually work, you know, when we were shooting, like, cause you know, you never know. And I go, I feel like we're doing something really special. And he goes, it doesn't matter. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, he goes, it's about this experience right now. And they'll never be able to change this experience. And it really changed the way I think of things because um, I really wasn't doing that. I get it, like the journey, not the destination. But he really, and, and he had this whole theory about why he doesn't like to watch the movies or even do press about the movies. It's not because he doesn't 
he's um, an introvert or he's some guy who thinks, you know, I don't do press. It's literally because it spoils the experience. Because talking about it to some extent does, and certainly reading about it, does ruin the experience of this magic that we had in New York City for four months making a movie. I love Joaquin Phoenix and I admire what he does, but he does seem to have a slightly dive bomb um, um, approach to, to publicity, um, putting that clip on, uh, on the, on the uh, talk show. Um, I think just Joaquin has a really wicked sense of humor. Yeah. And he, like when we put that clip on the talk show, Jimmy Kimmel, that was his idea. He was acting, pretending like I sent it to Jimmy Kimmel, right? But everyone, he's such a good actor, everyone believes it. And then I get a million messages of people saying, you don't understand, Joaquin's an artist, you shouldn't have sabotaged him like that. You have no right to, you don't understand what a beautiful soul this is and you're ruining him on national television. And I would send these to Joaquin and I go, can I just tell everybody that this was your idea and this was a thing we were in on? And he'd go, no, no, don't you get it? This is, this is the moment. Meaning, it wasn't about the moment on TV, it's about this moment. It's the misunderstanding that he could revel in. But the idea that it would actually incite violence, did you expect people to suggest that? No, I mean, I think it was a ridiculous concept. If you really watch the movie, you go, well, why would this movie incite violence? Certainly uh, amongst a zillion movies that come out, why this movie? And, and they go, well, because you're making a movie about a type of person or you're showing sympathy or you're getting us to sympathize with a type of person or you're shining a spotlight on a type of person that doesn't deserve to be shined a spotlight on. And I, I would go to myself because I don't ever talk anymore. I'm talking now, but I've decided I shouldn't talk anymore. I think it's almost as ridiculous as like, you know, climate change deniers, you know, people who deny climate science in that you go, you go, isn't this a good thing that we're talking about this? Or do we want to pretend, you know how people get, they get upset by climate science denial, right? We all do, like, how are you not seeing this? Isn't this sort of the same thing? Like, are we just gonna pretend that these type of people don't exist? Are we gonna pretend that we haven't broken um, a social contract with a certain uh, group of people in this country and that there are ramifications of it? Is it really so bad to shine a spotlight on that? Is it really so bad to say we're failing as a human experiment and maybe we should shine a spotlight on this? It, it, to me, it was, it was so surprising that, again, there was so much pearl clutching about the movie from people that you wouldn't expect it from. Uh, Murray, one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? Um, I mean, the editing of, of, of a movie is always its own, you know, it's, it's, Movies are made three times. They're made when you write them, they're made when you shoot them, and they're made when you edit them. And so I always think the, the editor is always my, my last writing partner. It's the last draft of a screenplay. Um, so there weren't like um, any specific challenges in editing that I hadn't seen before. It was just with Joaquin, we had so much good material, as cliche as that sounds. And there's pretty much 14 different versions of Joker as a movie. Meaning like, if you made a left here instead of a right, it would be that movie. And if you made it, you know, if he went straight here instead of that, he just varies his takes so wonderfully and gives you so many ways to play a scene that every day would be like, okay, we're gonna, every, I mean, we would tackle scenes and they would take us a week to cut because again, it was like, choose your own adventure. It's like, how are we gonna go with this? And that just speaks to how amazing he is. And as far as the composer, Hilder, Hildur Gunnodotter. I, I have such a hard time with her name, Gunnodotter. Hildur's music, you know, here's the thing. When you're making a character study, and I, I didn't even know this really going in. I've made movies about groups of people my whole life. Um, one of the exciting things about this, it's not as mercenary as it looks, like trying to use DC to make a joke, you know, to, to, to make this thing. Part of the exciting thing, really one of the initial things that attracted me to it was oh man, I want to make a movie about one person. I want to do a deep dive character study. And then I thought about how hard it was to get those films made nowadays. And then I thought, wow, you can get those made if you made it about one of these guys. You know what I mean? So, so that is that. And why I'm talking about character studies is because when you do a movie about a single person, everything else becomes a character in the movie. So the production design is suddenly a character. You know, Gotham is a character in the film. 
Hilder's score literally became a character in the film. So it was so important and so crucial. And again, not for everybody, so I've learned. I love it. I think it's the heartbeat of the movie. I think it's all of what Arthur's, you know, internal, it's all the music in Arthur's head, basically. It's all Arthur's heavy shoes music in the beginner, beginning and Joker's operatic, you know, lunacy at the end. And Hilder, um, as you probably know now, because we've spoken about it before, you know, I sent her the script and asked her to write the music off the script, which I had never done before. Um, and I just wanted to see what it evoked in her without a lot of direction. I said, I just want to hear what it sounds like to you after you read it. And she just started sending me music and it was like amazing. So we had so much of the music written before we started shooting that all we would do is play it on set. did was it affected Joaquin's performance. It infected the set in a good way. It was playing in the camera operator's ear when he was shooting scenes. We just had it, I mean, it was offensive at some point. I mean, <laughs> it was too much, but we just had it there. It was just the music of the day and it was just around a lot. And um, I thought it was, a, it was a really interesting approach. I'd never done it like that before, but, uh, and I don't know that it would work for every movie, but for this, it was, it was really beautiful. Do you have any idea what you're going to do next? No, I am. I was just saying I'm closed for repairs. I'm not. I'm going to be done for a while. This has been a really. I mean, I'm laughing and we're having fun, but this has been a brutal experience for me. Um, putting this movie out into the world has been rough. Yes, it's worked out on paper. Uh, you know, it's doing really well, but it's it's not easy. I'm a pretty um, quiet person and pretty private person. I don't speak when I don't have to do interviews for a movie. You won't hear from me for three more years. It's just the way I always do it. But somehow when I speak around a movie or this movie, it just became something and it's just not who I am. So I'm looking forward to crawling back into a hole. <laughs>